give God another praise, if you will. We thank God for Pastor James and First Lady or, or Linda Buchanan, all the way from, I think it's Florissant, from St. Louis, Missouri. Amen. I think that's a suburb of St. Louis. Where are these lovely people? Oh, bless you indeed. Amen. Amen. Celebrate them, church. Amen. Marvelous to have you here with us. And uh, now I've learned something about, about uh, medicine. And I have it in the back there just in case the pain gets too terrible. But I've learned something about medicine. You can either be, you can have pain and be intellectually astute. Or you can be brilliant with pain. Or you can be, be pain free and dumb. <laughs> so I had to make a choice this morning uh, as to whether I want to be painless and somewhat intellectual or pain free and somewhat ignorant. So I made my choice. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and of course. And then we're going to jump into a memorial kind of a presentation next week, God's willing. So that means I won't get to temptation number three next week. So I got to put some sort of system together. We honor Bishop Bridges and for his word on last Sunday. And <laughs> Amen. And for those who have sat in. Beginning at verse 5, then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. This is Matthew 4, 5, now 6. Saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee, or concerning thee in the in the version that I'm reading, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Of course, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again, of course, he taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain. Now, we're talking a little bit about spectacularism. We're actually talking about the temptation from this point of view as contradistinctive and in opposition to the first temptation, which was simply very carnal and reaching for those things that we bring to the table because that's all we bring to the table. That's all that's in the world, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now that's the philosophical explanation of a theological position that is literally born out of the historical presentation of mankind dealing with the devil. The historical presentation begins in Genesis, of course, with, with Eve. She saw that it was something to be desired to make one wise, pride of life. Saw that it was good for food, lust of the flesh, and it was pleasant to the eyes. Now, it's the same thing that happens here with Jesus. Because, of course, the first one, he's really hungry. It's not in his mind. He, 40 days, he hasn't eaten. The body is now eating itself, so he's really hungry. So the first temptation is going to deal with the lust of the flesh. Understanding one's appetites. Understanding how to master one's appetite. 
You got to check your appetite. You got to check the appetite while you have control over the appetite. Because the appetite gets away from you, then you're into addiction. Satan likes to move us into addiction. Because once he moves you into addiction, you now are fighting yourself. Yeah, we've got some folk here that understands what I'm talking about. You gotta have to come through that battle. And it's interesting that there is no laying on of hands that moves addiction. So there's a few things we got to discuss here. I was sick, but that didn't mean I couldn't meditate. There's a few things we need to discuss. The first thing that we need to discuss, oh, oh thank you. Uh, Y'all can take all these, yeah. The first thing we need to discuss is a little bit more ethereal, a little bit more ontological, particularly in the discussion I had with a few preachers the other day. So I want to throw this out to you for the few minutes that I have, and I'm going to try to be a man, stand. Is the temptation of Jesus, is it going on in his mind? Or is it actually taking place from an historical platform? Or is it literally Satan operating in his mind? So it's in his mind. He is hungry, and it is in his mind that he's on the top of the temple. Is it in his mind that he is shown all the wonders of the world? Is it simply in his mind or is Satan moving him about from the wilderness? He took him to the top of the pinnacle of the temple and he took him to an exceeding high mountain. And the question I'm projecting to you is all of this happening in his mind. So he's in a secluded place with Satan in the wilderness and Satan is running all these things through his mind now that's that's one position I'm throwing it out to you because I'm going to make a statement based on the text and that is that and I'm going to upset your equilibrium, I intend to. And that is that he was only in the wilderness for one temptation. If it's not in his mind. See, there are those who want to project that the temptations were all in his mind. Was that man real or was he just in your mind? <laughs> was that bad check that you attempted to write? Did you have a literal checkbook and you were writing the wrong thing in there? 
or was that only in your mind? See, the debate between those who are given not to take the Bible literally, but have this proclivity to take it from a very subjective theological position, a conviction that may or may not necessarily have any hermeneutics to it, just simply a personal conviction that it was in his mind. How many of your temptations were just in your mind? Because there's something about the tree that was good for food. That sound like it's leaving the mind. Something to be desired to make one wise. Because of the debate Satan suggested when he introduced doubt that God does not want you to be as smart as he is. So this fruit right here, right here, right here, this one right here, This is the one that will elevate you to the next level. He's, she's looking at a fruit. Jesus is dealing with real situations. And if he's dealing with real situations, then the question now becomes, how many temptations actually took place in the wilderness? And if God released him to be tempted in the wilderness, does Satan have the power to take him to the temple? And does Satan have the power to transport him to a high mountain? Which now would indicate that the only temptation that was in the wilderness was the first one. Because if I just read a while ago, it said it took him. Satan took him. Now, you and I know that Satan can't do anything unless he has been of God. Talk to me, children. I'm going to make a quick switch. I think it's germane. The arguments that everybody's having now is that we need to focus on what's happening with the Antichrist. And of course, the latest thing now is that everything is now being set up for the, for the Antichrist. And this is what's got everybody so nervous and upset. Because everybody's looking out now for this mark of the beast looking for who the Antichrist is going to be. So everybody's searching now for signs. And we're going to go right into the next scripture, this scripture we're dealing with right now. And we're going to show you that when you have a relationship with the Lord, that's good. You don't need a sign. Jesus made it clear that it's a wicked generation that needs or looks for a sign. What do I need a sign for if Jesus and I are tight? What, what, why do I need to know when he's coming if I'm already ready? Why should your teaching set me up to look for the spectacular when that's all Satan operates in? He 
cannot operate in the quiet expression of a relationship with God that does not necessitate an outward validation of any kind that I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. A relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is predicated upon his spirit saying to your spirit that you are a child of God. There is nothing external that you need to have to corroborate your relationship with God if you don't have it in your own spirit and in your own heart. The problem with religion is religion needs confirmation from other members of religion. But spiritual people are automatically connected without even asking. already connected. See, we gotta argue this now. And I don't use arguing in terms of, you know, most people use argue to fight. And argue, an argument is presenting a, an opinion. The reality of the temptation is significant to prove that he was tempted in all points the same as we are. My biggest battles are won and lost in my mind. But that woman I had problems with wasn't in my mind. That alcohol bottle I had problems with wasn't in my mind. Uh, mind, take a drink. <laughs> that money we wanted to steal and them clothes we wanted to shoplift wasn't in our minds. It was something we looked at, we desired it, and when a man commits adultery in his heart, the reason he has committed it in his heart is because he is saying all I need now is the opportunity. It's already settled in my mind. If she say anything to me, And women are, women are different from men, particularly if you've been trained. Because if you're trained to say no, you don't say yes easily. So which means then, for the woman who is trained and, and godly, She's going to have a struggle with it. Yes. Yes. And you see, you know, you know, I'm here talking today and I'm, I'm really suffering. But I'll tell you this. None of you have me fooled. Into thinking that you all ain't struggling with anything. You all can look sanctified all you want to. The truth is that we came to the table with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And it's real. It's real. And one of the things that they did wrong with me when I was growing up not consciously, I don't think they did it on purpose, was they kept trying to send me back to the altar 
about things I have to get the victory over. The suggestion was that I didn't get it right. If you get the Holy Ghost right, then you don't have these struggles. Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost when he went into the wilderness released of God to be tempted by the devil. He led him in there to be tempted. And now I want to make a comparison real quick. I might have to sit down, but you might have to make a comparison here. How is it that he leads Jesus into the wilderness, the spirit, to be tempted of the devil? And then he turns around and says, when I pray my model prayer, I must pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me. He leads him through the Holy Ghost to be tempted. But he tells me, pray not to be led into temptation but pray for deliverance from evil. He had to lead Jesus, the spirit, to be tempted. Because without the leading of the spirit to put him in that place, he would never be in that place of himself. You don't have to ask God to lead you into temptation. Because you heading there anyway. Oh, I wish somebody would understand. I'm going to preach to some grown folk one day. Your prayer is whatever it is that will get my attention that'll pull me into temptation. I need you as my bulwark. I need you as my refuge because I've already got the inclination and I was already shaping and born in sin, shaping in iniquity. So I have the proclivity already to go into stuff I don't need to be in. So what I need you to do, Lord, is don't let it come my way because I can't handle it like Jesus. Woo. In my prayer, lead me not into temptation, when temptation is made up of enticement and desire. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his idiosyncratic lust. Quit bragging about what you don't, what you got over that you didn't like. Amen. I thank and praise the Lord. The Lord kept me. I thank and praise the Lord. Because he, man thought I was that easy. I thank and praise the Lord because then the Holy Ghost stood up in me and I, and I just let him know that I'm not that type of woman. I'm not that type of man. I thank and praise the Lord that he kept me. He kept me from what you didn't want. The preacher, the preacher was closing his message and he was preaching to one of the greatest preachers that I have ever heard. 
Bishop Carl F. Smith, Columbus, Ohio, the late Bishop Carl F. Smith. And he was preaching for him. And at the close of his message, he was talking about another super preacher. And as he was closing his message, he referred to the woman who came to his house and said, Brother Preacher, I've, just, I've been baptized and I'm seeking the Holy Spirit. And he said, that's, that's good. I'm praying for you that you will receive it. And he closed the door and went back in the house and brother pastor I am not finished I want you to know I love you after the loose your hole he was testifying everywhere about how powerful he was he didn't say it in those terms but that's how it come across. The pastor said to him who he was preaching for, he said, I heard your testimony. I heard it. I heard the expression of your victory and rightfully so give God glory. But there is a coming a woman that you ain't going to say nothing about. Amen. You have testified so ebulliently about all the stuff you have had the victory over. But there's a groan instead of an expression that's articulate. The last time you prayed. You prayed for everybody loud. You call names loud when you pray. What were you saying when you went to mm. Help me, Lord. Because part of going to prayer is going to prayer with the convictions that the Holy Spirit has placed in your spirit. To bring you to the place of confession. To bring you to the place where you acknowledge to God. Yes, you were right and I am wrong. I need your help to overcome this thing. So don't lead me that way. Amen. I'm, I'm too weak to be in a nightclub. I'm going to come down and talk to you now. Bring me that chair if you have to. The prayer lead me not in temptation, into temptation. Whereas he led Jesus, he's telling you don't pray that prayer. You don't want to be in a situation that's going to push you to the limit of who you are because you're bringing your desire to the table. So I don't want to be tempted. So Lord, when my desire is high, remove the enticement. You all ain't that powerful. Ain't none of us in here that powerful that we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not have to pray to fear no evil. Come on, talk to me now. We got so much mental issues going on now because of this pandemic. I'm laying up sick in my bed and people walking in my house, I don't know. Amen. And people never heard about no 357 Magnums and stuff. That's why I say, pray, lead me not into temptation. You laying up in your bed and somebody walk in your room you don't know. <laughs> Amen. 
Amen. I don't know if to say amen to that. And sometimes we as preachers, we don't know what to say. And he fell and broke his foot. Thank you, Jesus. Just filling in. It's really not applying. Just, you're just filling in. Oh, yeah, you got a car crash. Glory be to God. Some things you don't, you, you, can't, you can't fill in. Lead me not into temptation because I already have the proclivity, the tendency, a better word, the predilection. It is so strong. And the greatest Christians are the people who did the most in the world. Start with Paul. The people who go after God with everything they have are those people who know if I don't go after God, I'm going to go after something negative. So Lord, lead me not into temptation. I don't need this right now because my desires are too aflame. Don't put nothing close to me that I like. Oh, I don't know what you're praying about. But I'm praying when I look at myself and look at my proclivities and my tendencies and look at if I don't spend my time doing what God would have me to do, I'll spend my time doing something else. I have to ask him, don't let it come my way. Hey Amen. you know the temptation you're having now, financial difficulties, and you're having financial difficulties and you have numbers in your Rolodex? Somebody been begging you to call. Hey Amen. I got the answer for your, for your pandemic, honey. Lead us not into, but he led him to be tempted of the devil. So it suggests to me that he gave him over to whatever Satan wanted to do. In my meditation, I immediately thought about Job. So it is not unusual for God to challenge Satan on the purity and strength of his saints. That's a whole nother, the whole nother point of view now. Lead me not into temptation and yet still have you considered my servant Job. Lead me not into temptation is my prayer. But have you considered my servant Job? The question now becomes, is consideration significant of your strength? Talk to me. You're in a battle right now. I'm in a battle right now. We're in battles. But the level and the intensity of the battle is that according to your strength. You see, the thing is paradoxical to me. The thing is, it's, it's oxymoronic. Because on the one hand, I can look and admire Job and everybody in here has to have some admiration for Job. Now, when you study your Bible, you want to see who the female Job is. That's Naomi. Naomi is on the woman's side. So here I am struggling to make it in. If the righteous, scarcely, I ain't never seen so many judgmental righteous folk who got it made. 
all the righteous folk I see in the Bible are fighting their way through. Talk to me, saints. Fighting their way through. Fighting their way through this pandemic. Fighting their way through economic difficulties. Finding their way through being locked up in the house with a man or a woman that you didn't know you didn't want to be with like that. I mean, I mean, I don't know why church people think that when you deal with temptations and you deal with situations of people falling or people being restored, that you're dealing with a situation that's not real. It's real. It's real for every one of our lives, for every day of our living to make the kind of decisions that make us feel good about a relationship with God. And when you have a relationship with God, you don't need a sign. Everybody's setting us up for the spectacular. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is smelling your enemy while you're fighting. This is being in the middle of stuff when you find yourself crying and don't understand why you're crying because your spirit is in a battle. It's a spiritual warfare that is releasing itself like a volcano through your tears. Oh, yes. And I'm looking at the children of God all over this place. And their struggles may be hid to you, but it's not hid to them nor God. And we need a church spirit and a church atmosphere that allows me to admit that I'm in a struggle. So that I don't have to look at your hypocritical attitude and you judging me when you're in a struggle yourself. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. I'm, I'm learning something. I'm learning. I'm learning something. I'm learning something about love in the struggle. One thing, about, one thing about being in love, being in love is to be in tune. Amen. Amen. To be in love means to be connected. Amen. You in New York, the woman is in Miami. You get a phone call, uh, what you doing? What you mean what I'm doing? Oh, I just feel something in my spirit. You ain't had no relationship if you've never had that. You ain't been in no relationship if you haven't had somebody on the other side. Look like they looking through your glasses. <laughs> to be in love is to be connected. Amen. To feel what somebody is feeling without them expressing it. To have a burden placed on you that you didn't reach for. To be in love is to be connected. And the connection does not vary with the circumstance. It ain't about how much money you have. It ain't about whether we're in a two bedroom, one bedroom studio, or we're in a mansion. We're just connected. 
when I'm in love with God and he is in love with me, there is a connection. Oh, I wish somebody would understand it. That is an everyday relationship that is not looking for a Christmas because every day is Christmas. Not looking for an Easter. Every day is Easter. Not looking for any particular religious ceremony because every day is a religious ceremony when we're connected. That's why he led him and told me to pray not to get in that. Now, I don't know about your prayer life, but my prayer life makes me watchful. You don't pray about something and not be watchful. Watch and pray. You're watching because it is in your watching that you determine how much you need. Ain't no such thing as an ignorant Christian. You cannot walk with God and be ignorant. I'm in love with you, you in love with me, and I don't know you. And I don't get to know you either. Come on, talk to me, saint. You're in love, you're feeling somebody. I'm feeling that. I felt you last week. Some of my friends, I'm not even talking about no personal in love romance. I'm talking about Negroes across the world. It's, it's, it's the proper word. Across the world. When you get a text or an email, say, man, I'm thinking about you. Haven't heard from you, but I'm thinking about you and praying for you. Over here, I, I had a burden for you. Connected. Connected because the Holy Spirit speaks to somebody about you in a way that you wouldn't express it. So why does the Holy Spirit have you praying for me? The Holy Spirit has you praying for me because I won't tell you I need you to pray for me. But God just placed you in my spirit. And he didn't ask me to call you to find out was anything wrong. He just rolled me out of the bed and your name came up and I called your name before the Lord. I don't have to pry into your business. God already knows your business. Lead me not. Because I can't handle it. Like Jesus came. So I ain't trying to get in it. I'm talking serious business here this morning. You can get, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. I haven't begun to talk about consequence. what you got to pay out because of 15 minutes 
of indiscretion. He led him in there. But he tells you don't pray to go there. Don't pray to go there. And when you start praying, you start watching. Because you're watching to see what to pray for. You're watching for God to give you a revelation of what you're about to get in. You're, you're watching. You're watching to see who it is God is going to designate as the individual to avoid or the individual to get with. You're watching to see how God is going to answer the prayer that you just presented. You're watching to see how he's going to bring you out of a situation you got yourself in. You're watching. You don't pray alone. You watch too. I need your mind in here. Lord have mercy. So let me, let me, let me get into this. They told me don't go too long. God's going to help me. Uh, I don't need a setback. Because I get real guilty when I'm not here. He teaches us. And he does it very well. That to be tempted in all points as we are. He has to be directed into certain things. That he in and of himself would not find himself in that place. You gotta understand the significance of that. If you checked closely, you will see throughout the Gospels that certain things happen that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Read those very carefully when you study. That the scriptures might be fulfilled. So there are certain things that he leads him into that he tells us to pray not to get in it. Now, he tells his disciples, don't go into the way of the Samaritans. Don't enter into the cities of the Gentiles because you're only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What was he doing? Please tell me, what was he doing in Tyre and Sidon? When he told his disciples, don't go there. Then when the woman asked him for a favor, he answered her, not a word. Jesus, don't you know that it's ill-mannered for somebody to talk to you and you don't answer? Amen. Don't you hear me talking to you? Do you know how many of us would have lost that blessing that day? Attitude, disposition, impatient, quick to get ugly. You'd lose a blessing. You'd really lose it when he called you a dog. Now, the measure then that all of us have got to evaluate 
during the course of our lives walking with Jesus is what attitude would I have or have I had that has kept me from many a good blessing. I have received all of my blessings that didn't come with a challenge. But I've had difficulty receiving blessings that came with an insult. That's why the Lord said to John the Baptist, he said, blessed is the man who is not offended in me. Uh, somebody just hollered, don't trip. <laughs> yeah. Many times we trip at where God has us. Many times. But he went into Tyre and Sidon to show those of us who are so caught up on religiosity that there are times when you suspend the rules to bless somebody else. Why is it that people don't rush to be around church folk? Because we have a tendency to hold up where we are and make it the standard for everybody else when each individual has to find God for themselves in the space that he has put them in. And that's why he moved into Tyre and Sidon to show us that grace suspends the rules. This is why if you're in a love relationship with the Lord, you keep his commandments. Because if you love me, and you cannot have a relationship with that kind of power, and it not bring you to conviction. I'm talking about the conviction that is so intense that you see nobody else, not even your accomplice. Oh yeah, and I keep telling people, whoever will sin with you will sin against you. And we need to tell all the young fellas that we're raising and training and, and, and don't get in no car with somebody who has no future. Oh, well, y'all don't believe me? That the person who sinned with you will, will, will sin against you? You don't believe that? That who will sin with you will sin against you? Ask how many of our boys are locked up now because the DA cornered one of them. All of them did the crime, but the DA cornered one of them and he ratted on the rest so he could get less a sentence. Huh? You don't sin, you, you sin with me. Now both of us went down there and robbed the store. Now you over there singing like a hummingbird. Sin with your sin against you. Who called your deacon board after you went with her? Amen. Who called your wife? See, you all make this thing, you all make this whole scripture and spiritual thing like it's something way out there in the, in the forest somewhere. It's right here in the middle of this house. When the Lord is telling us 
that if you're walking with me, I'm going to expose you. Because you can't walk in the light as he is in the light and carry a whole lot of darkness. I got enough information on the Antichrist. I don't have enough information on Jesus. I got enough on the Antichrist, but I need more of Jesus because I need to be more like him. And anybody like Jesus don't have to worry about no Antichrist. Talk to me, children of God. I don't need a sign. Already got the sign. This is my beloved son. In whom I'm well pleased. Already got the sign. The Holy Spirit already descended. So now let's get back to the discussion for a few minutes. And then I'm going to close. The hunger temptation is over. So now he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. Satan is not going to attack you where he's discovered your strength. Mm -mm. He don't want to attack me in my strength. You're wasting your time. You can't get me to buy what I don't want. You got to find out what I want in order to tempt me. Amen. I wonder how long Satan been following you around before he put the temptation in front of you. You, you think he's not checking you out? I'm sure he watches what you watch on TV. He came with you when you went from PG to R. I am not going to deal with you in your weakness. Because then I will only be a tempter in the street. But since you like to quote scriptures, I'm going to come to church with you. I went by the club and I couldn't find you. I went by your mistress's house and I heard you gave her up. I went with you down, went to see the candy man and I haven't seen you there. I stopped by the jailhouse and I couldn't find you. Looks like you got over the lust of the flesh pretty good. But when I went to your usual spots, I didn't find you. I discovered you in church now. So since I can't play the flesh game in church, what game can I play? I can't get you to walk behind God in the flesh, in your flesh. So I tell you what I'll do, I'll get you to walk before God. 
in your spirituality. I'll either get you ahead of God or get you behind God as long as you ain't with God. I'll make you just as nasty in church. And I'll get you to cause more damage in church than I could get you at the strip club. Amen. You weren't condemning and strutting how holy you are in front of everybody while you was at the club. At the club, you was dodging to see who was watching. You know, I, I told Bishop Jake so and said, <laughs> I got to laugh before I quit. I told Bishop Jake, I said, you know when you're sanctified and you're doing the wrong thing. I said, I said, Thomas, you ever seen a rat eating up on some cheese? <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, ain't no way that joker can enjoy that cheese. She is just way too nervous. You know you in trouble when you nervous with what you doing. Talk to me now, I'll read your mail. Now you know you in trouble when you gotta be looking over your shoulder wondering who's calling on the phone, wondering what's going on. Ain't no peace in that. I'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me and part of that being in peace is doing the right thing. Just doing the right thing. You don't need no lawyers when you've done the right thing. You're borrowing money now over stuff and the money you can't keep because the money already spent. Try to get you out of a situation that God told you you ought to pray. Lead me not. The focus on Jesus was missed. Because everything points to him. And when you take it and make it yours and not his, your blessing is still his. Your life that you're breathing and living and moving, you're moving in him. It's in him you move. It's in him you have your being. It's in him you operate. So I don't need no news about the devil. I'm focusing on Jesus. I don't need no news. This is why you're upbeat all the time. Because no matter how negative things are, that ain't where your mind is. My mind is stayed on him. He is my point. He is what I look at. He is my redeemer. He is my way out. He is my door where there is no door. He is my window where there is no window. That's where I gotta focus. I'm closing. I'm going to church with you. And I'm going to know how you handle your Bible will indicate to me what your relationship with Jesus Christ is all about. I'm going to figure that out by how you handle the scriptures. I want to know do you have the power 
to recover somebody with your use of scripture. Or your use of scripture, does it leave people broken and condemned? Because I can give you the right scripture and you see it the wrong way. Oh, I wish I'd talked to you. Yeah. Uh, here is the test. You want to quote scriptures? Okay. I have been allowed to take you where I want to take you. I'm going to take you where I want to take you. And scripture quoting belongs to the temple. You're a scripture quoter, eh? You believe in the Bible, eh? Then all right, let's test it. Let's test it. Let's take the scripture and make God comply. Yes, yes, yes. Let's make God respond. We're going to make him respond. How many times have you heard, if you want to move God, give him his words back. Tell him his words back. I want to talk to some saints here. I want to talk to saints who like to rebuke people with their Bible. And they do it as if they have a right to do it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, um, uh, it's time to quit, but I'm feeling better. <laughs> they want to slap you with the scriptures. Here you walk in the, in the house, in the Lord's house. And all of a sudden, somebody comes in the house and want to call you a devil. She ain't nothing but a devil. She ain't nothing but a, but a devil. He ain't no good. He ain't nothing but a devil. The Lord rebuke you. Get out of my face. The scripture says, The use of scripture that is not fostered by the Holy Spirit is going to end up being used wrong. You cannot feel or you should not feel, I shouldn't feel, like the Bible is a weapon that God gave me to beat up on people I don't like. Or I'm having difficulties getting along with. So what Satan simply says, now you like to quote scriptures. Okay. Then let's take this scripture that God gave you and let's put him to the test. Satan didn't say it that way. What Satan did was he's boosting Jesus' ego to do something spectacular to get spectacular results from God to prove you are his child. Now, you and I got serious problems. 
if we start trying to prove to the devil that we are God's children, you don't know it yet. The spirit hasn't testified to your spirit yet. Let me tell you something, children of God. There's a preacher that'll come in here and make all of us feel unsafe. There's another one that'll come in here and heal all of us. We all saved again. There's one who'll come in here and preach hell till you smell the smoke. And there's another who will come in and extol the virtues of grace. You will have them come in from the left. You'll have them coming from the right. You'll have very few in the middle. At the end of the day, when everybody's done, the question comes back to you. How are you tied up with Jesus? Or who are you tied up with? Because we have become more concerned about the preacher than the message. trying to close I'm trying to close I'm going to finish with that one yet the focus of the scriptures is not to be used for self aggrandizement manipulation and exploitation take it out of context and use it to prove a point that the scripture ain't trying to make. And Satan is smarter in the scriptures than most of us. Ain't no sense you being quiet. Amen. He been hanging with God a long time. And what he wants to do is put the scripture in your mouth so you can tear up the church with it. This is why the greatest threat to the church is not sin. Y'all can forget that. Everybody in here know when somebody's sinning. I mean, you ain't figured out when somebody's drunk yet. Amen. You know that woman wasn't his wife. You know that wasn't her husband. Amen. They didn't expect to see you at, at, at uh, in Vegas. They didn't expect to see you. You know sin. What has devastated us during this pandemic had nothing to do with sin. It had to do with how we were taught to be able to handle what has come our way. And with false teaching, you never are equipped to deal with the situation in front of you. The word helps us to deal with whatever comes our way. I'm learning that. He fortifies me to deal with what I got to deal with. Sickness, brokenness, heartache, divorce, death children acting up the word now here's what Jesus says for you search the scriptures for in them you think you will have eternal life but these are they that testify of me you can't go into the Bible and not come up with Jesus 
You got to come up with Jesus. How would Jesus treat me? How would Jesus treat you? How would Jesus treat the person you were having so much difficulty with? And I've discovered this. He loves everybody. He ain't got no exclusive on me. I'm closing. He says, but you're not willing to come to me that you might understand the scriptures. When I come out of the scriptures, I come out with an attitude that's more Christ-like towards you. The church is not a place of condemnation. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I didn't come to the world to condemn the world. That the world might be saved through me. Every child of God, every Bible toting child of God should be Christ-like. What am I reading it for? The Bible is not a sword of the flesh. It is the sword of the spirit. It's the sword of the spirit that pierces. It pierces. It ain't cutting back and forth. The scripture says it pierces. It goes through the flesh, through the soul, into the spirit. And it's there I defeat the devil. I defeat him in my spirit and I express it through my mind. I feel like giving God the glory. I feel like lifting him up. I feel like telling the Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me an understanding of your word so I can use your word not to tempt God, but use your word to praise God. Use your word to lift him up. Use your word to give him glory. Anytime you see me coming, I got a word on my lips because I got a word in my heart and the word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I didn't come to church to put anybody down. I came to lift you up by the power of the word. I'm getting ready to close, but the word will give you joy. The word will give you victory. The word will give you power. The word will give you a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. I feel like lifting him up. I feel like giving him some glory. I'm feeling better right now. Don't know how I feel later, but I'm feeling better right now. Somebody holler. If it wasn't for the word, I would have lost my path, lost my way, lost my mind, lost my joy, lost my deliverance, lost my love. If it wasn't for the word, I don't get the word to test God. I don't have to test God. He's already proved I'm caught on by myself. He's already proved. Yeah, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, cause I, I am with you. Somebody all up. Power in the word. Power in the word. Quote it. 
study it repeat it pray it sing it rejoice in it ah! oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah I feel like shouting I feel like praising the Lord I didn't know I'd feel this good but there is power power As I conclude, he took him, and the second temptation, and, I, and I'm just saying this because as we go to pray, watch, watch, and pray, and the word tells you what to watch for. And the word tells you how to pray. I want to say this to those of you who are going to be the front, the front line for where we're going to go from here. And I'm talking about Christianity, period. And I'm talking to front line people. I want you to watch the second temptation and make sure that you follow Jesus through this. Because you gotta win, you can't lose this. The second temptation was full of holy things. The only thing tell me nothing about holy eliminates you from being mean and ugly. holy things. First of all, he took him to the holy city. Then he took him atop the holy temple. And then he sets in front of him the holy scriptures. Now, might I say holy, holy, holy? Holy city, holy temple, holy scriptures. So the first temptation smells like a bakery. And the second has the aroma of orthodox liturgy. So after you've done all of that singing and we've done all of that preaching and all of that praying, we have to ask ourselves, when he was taking us up higher and higher did our spirits become less and less should this pulpit make me ugly 
should this be a place for you to be able to spit out what you want on people around you? Is that what he called you to do? All in the word of standing up for God, since God told you this, then jump off here. Since God told you he's a healer, then you don't need no mask or no vaccine. Let God stick by his word. Jesus said, I ain't, I, I'm not tempting the Lord thy God. That ain't what I got this word in me for. So he takes one scripture to modify the other. He goes right back to Deuteronomy 6. The word of God is not to be played with saints. It's not to be used in your anger. It's not to be used in your envy. It's not to be used against any group of people. The word of God is to be used for the benefit of the people around us. Father, I come in the name of Jesus and I thank you for your word. And I thank you because we're not here to tempt you or to test you. We're here to follow you wherever you lead. We are not leading now. We're following you. We're not asking you to bless our program. We want you to tell us what your program is. So we can get in with your program. So that others might be benefited. So now I pray. That those of us that are in this house will pray for those who are outside of the ark of safety. For those who aren't born again, we pray that everything in our life and everything in our speech will bring them closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody in this building, the Lord is calling. He's calling. 